Welcome to Your Right to Know by the Fitchburg Republican City Committee. My name is Mary Lotz and I will be your host for this evening's show. Joining us by not only popular demand of our viewers, but popular demand of our Fitchburg Republican City Committee members and many others is our favorite sheriff, Sheriff Lou Evangelides, who is the High Sheriff of Worcester County. Welcome, Sheriff Mary, Lou. always great to be back. And it's wonderful to have you back. And you just always have so much to bring to the table and so much to share with us and our viewers of what's going on in Worcester County. So to get over the formalities, yeah. welcome again and let's sure. just jump into it. Yeah. Um, so much is happening and you've mm -hmm. been spending a lot of time in Fitchburg recently. Uh, most recently in March you had several opportunities to be here so I'd like to kind of explore sure. why and what you were doing here. Um, well, I'll just mention one thing. I mean, it's a blessing to be sheriff, and we have 60 towns in the county, and, you know, it's, it's an amazing operation to be sheriff because we have tentacles and great employees and a great organization, and I'm proud of the fact that we don't just focus on the jail in West Boston, but we can make an impact and help people all throughout the county. And obviously, Fitchburg is an important part of Worcester County. It's a great historical city, and it has a large population, and, and uh, the jail services uh, do extend out to Fitchburg. And because of that, with our neighborhood center, we have our Fitchburg Cope Office, um, and amongst many other things, we have plenty of reasons to be out in Fitchburg, sure. and I'm always proud and happy to be in this community and always well received by the people of Fitchburg. Well, I know everyone truly appreciates what you do for us and, and what programs uh, you have that also help us along the way. I just kind of like to set a little bit of a stage of describing Worcester County, the jail system, and the House mm -hmm. of Correction system. And I was reading, because this is kind of where we're going to focus, I was reading in doing a little prep work that you have about 1,200 inmates at the jail in the House of Correction. Out of that, 90% are in the jail system because of drug abuse and crimes related right. to their abuse. So this is really eating up a lot of your responsibilities in, in the jail system, that it doesn't just turn from maybe, and I'll use the word maybe inappropriately, penal institution, a corrections right. institution, but you have so many other responsibilities because we're taking these, in your case, all men. Yes. And we're taking them out of, at a young age, mm -hmm. sometimes with limited education, limited skills. And this is also landing on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about the expanded responsibilities sure. that the sheriff department has? Well, I mean, we have so many different responsibilities, but you're going to the essence of, of, the, of the job, which is the actual inmate population. Mm -hmm. So as you pointed out, I mean, 90% of the inmates at the Worcester County Jail and House of Correction, and just to back up for a moment, because I never assume people know a lot sure. about the jail, because frankly, there's, there's a few places in the world, the less time you spend, the better. Jail is definitely one of them. The less we know, the, the better. The less you yes. know, the better. Your life's going well if you're not will, you know, very familiar with what goes on up there. But just to let your listeners know, we have both a jail and a house of correction. And the jail are for people who are pretrial. They've been arrested. They've been unable to bail themselves out. They're awaiting trial. They're a large population of the jail. And the flip side are those, are those who are go to trial, are sentenced, but to less than two and a half years, non-felony convictions, they will serve their time at the Worcester County House of Correction. So, but within that population across the board, about 90% of those people in that facility are drug and alcohol addicted, substance abusers. It's so obvious, and when you go around the jail as I do, and you talk to people, and you, you know, as I talk to our great employees, and I also talk to the inmates, and I try to help because in the end, I know, Mary, that the job people sent me there to do was to help keep this community safer. And as sheriff, my job means I've got to have those thousands of people that go through our facility, some for a day, some for a week, some for a year. But thousands will walk out that door. Mm -hmm. And every person that works at our facility in any fashion, whether they be you know, nurses, social workers, of course the correctional staff, but everybody's got to be on the same page. We have to do everything in our power to make sure those people who walk out that door and they come back to our communities right here. Right. 
When they come back, they're less likely to repeat offend than when they got there. Mm -hmm. And with the drug and alcohol being 90% of the reason that people tell me, I'm here because of choices I made with drugs and alcohol, my addictions, um, that's the crux of, of the issue. And, and one judge said to me recently, he said, Sheriff, if we, you know as well as I do that if we could get drugs and alcohol out of the system, yeah. we could probably turn our courthouses into movie theaters and our jails into movie theaters, but we're not, that isn't happening. Right. Because this is not only a, a big problem, it's not getting, you know, we're not going away. Sure. So with that in mind, we have, that's our responsibility to deal with that population. But with that, Mary, because you asked me, the beginning of the question was, you know, what are the areas? Well, the other things that we get that people might not think about is not only 90% are addicts, but between 30 and 50 percent have mental health issues. Sure. Because really addiction goes very hand in hand with mental health. And remember, there used to be a lot of state hospitals. You know, I remember like yeah. there was a, for example, in my neck of the woods, there was Rutland State Hospital, yeah. there was Belchertown State Hospital. Sure. They're gone now. Right. And the mental health problem has not gone away. But it's been transferred to other responsibilities, and one of those landing spots has become jails. Isn't that unfortunate? Yeah, so we have, we have two areas of our facility, but one particularly building that is designated for mental health issues. And there are people that truly probably don't belong in a correctional facility, at least not in mine. Mm -hmm. But the, we have Belcher Town, we have um, Bridgewater State Hospital, which can handle mental health acute issues. But instead of sending all our inmates that have mental health issues there to be served by their staff, for example, our correctional officers work hard. They're well trained, but they're not mental health specialists. Right. I mean, you need very significant specialized training for that, which we have mental health, but it's expensive. And we have a limited staff. We have a director of mental health services and, a, and some nurses and doctors in that area, but it's only a handful of people or so. So they're overwhelmed with our population and we have limited places to put them and that gets into suicide watches and many serious issues that go with it. So there's an example of things you wouldn't think about or the health care of inmates falls in the responsibility of the Worcester County Sheriff's Department. We've had people, Mary, believe it or not, who come into our facility if they need kidney dialysis, if they need uh, medical care for whatever reason, a heart attack or something in the, while they're incarcerated. That is on the Worcester County Sheriff's Department's, that's our financial responsibility. So we have to bring them to the hospital. We have to bring two officers to the hospital with them 24 seven mm -hmm. coverage, which people don't think about. So there's many areas of the jail, but the inmate population and the substance abuse issues, as you pointed out at the beginning of this question, really is the essence of what we do. And I know that as sheriff, like I said, we have to make sure, I think people did not send me up there to sit in my office all day. They didn't send me in there to just, you know, business as usual. I know the message I received. I had a lot of great support here as, as elsewhere. And I campaigned on the idea that we would do things different. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I wanted to do was raise the hiring standards. So now we have the highest standards in Massachusetts. If you want to work at the Worcester County House of Correction Jail, higher standards than the state's Department of Correction, mm -hmm. which pay better but I will not lower my standards. We have people with, they have to have a college degree and or medical or, or military service. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So everybody comes in, we've got the greatest people, we've got the greatest training programs. That's a great step forward. You know, I don't take contributions from any employees. I was the first sheriff to ever say, I will never take a contribution from an employee or their spouses. So the only way to get promoted uh, is to work hard. Is to work hard. So I've tried to really work, focus on the professionalism, and I'll tell you, it's been outstanding. And the, the, the people that work there work so hard in such difficult circumstances. Corrections is not a world for everybody. Mm -hmm. But for those who do it, and, and, and you know, we had Mike Flynn as a sheriff, you know, two sheriffs before me, and God rest his soul, I know he was a beloved figure here yes. in Fitchburg, and truly a gentleman. One of, I came very close uh, friends with Mike Flynn in my years as sheriff, and. He was a really compassionate, caring man. Uh, I just have a different way of doing mm -hmm. business, but we, we're all working with that population and we've got some great people helping me. So the, the job is everywhere. So you, it's, a, it's a complex, uh, it's really like a city we run up there, but the idea everybody's gotta focus on is we know people are gonna get out of there because you know they're either going to state prison or they're getting out. Right. And I can't hold them. Some people I wish I could, mm -hmm. but they're gonna get out there. This is the American justice system. They've served their sentence, they're going out. We do everything in our power to give them the tools to succeed when they get out. Transition into housing, transition into substance abuse programming, get them on the proper medical care. Because if any of those things fall apart, they don't get, you know, obviously jobs is number one. So as President Reagan said, sure. the greatest social program is a job. job. But all those things we try to do, and if we do them well, we know that people are less likely to recommit a crime 
than when they got there. And that's what we're working on. So it's challenging, it's exciting. I love the job, I'm blessed to have it. And I hope and pray that the job we do, and we do it well, will help keep the citizens of Worcester County safer. I had, when people get out, now there was a program that was just advertised or, or written about in our local Sentinel and mm -hmm. Enterprise. And it, this was called, um, the well it's in Cleghorn, mm -hmm. and it was called the Fitchburg Community Correction Center. Correct. And recently, you were in attendance, they graduated yeah. somewhere 19, 20 people from a drug and alcohol. Yep. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because it was painful to read some of the people's uh, stories as, yeah. as the article was written. I mean, one went on to say, going to jail is the best thing that ever happened right. to me. And this is how we started out by saying, you've lived a good life if you don't know anything yeah. about the jail system. And this is someone who said, it was the best thing that ever happened mm -hmm. to me. He says, today I have recovery and I've never had recovery before. So this program is very instrumental in helping yeah. the people that you're sending back to the communities. Yep. Could you talk a little about what sure. happens in this program? How do you get into it? Yeah. How long is it? Well, I think it's a model program, and, it, and it's, it's been in the Cleghorn neighborhood in Fitchburg for 20 or so years, um, and it's become an integral part of the neighborhood. And I think when you first bring these type of programs, which are called community correction centers, and just to back up a little, the, the normal population that ends up in there is they are run through the sheriff's department in, in conjunction with the probation department. But essentially this, you're on probation, you commit a crime, you maybe you're gonna go to prison, but we feel like you're a nonviolent offender, you're predominantly a drug offender. Uh, we're gonna give you an opportunity to take an alternative sentence with consequences. So people get referred to the Community Correction Center in Fitchburg, Claiborne, if they're from this area. So we're gonna say, and this is not, it's not, if it's public safety, we do public safety first. But if it comes down to the idea that we believe there's a more effective way to do it than just throw somebody in jail, because truth be told, it's expensive to have somebody in jail, and you can learn a lot about habits in right. jail. So if we can divert someone who we don't think poses a physical threat to the community, but is a criminal, has committed crimes, but if it's predominantly drug, we will send them to our center. In that center, we will drug test them on a daily basis, or at least we do it on, on a regular basis. It's a random, random drug testing. Random. So we drug test them on a regular basis. But we also hold them accountable for programming. And some of it is substance abuse programming, some of it's educational, vocational. But the idea is to give people, invest in them, get them an opportunity to complete their sentence on probation without violating, without going to prison for $60,000, $50,000 a year. Do these programs we do for about $5,000 a year per person. More cost effective, but at the same time is they're in their homes, they're feeding themselves, they're clothing themselves, and they're getting the programming and held accountable. So if they screw up, they can get violated and go to prison, but in the meantime, they can get these programs. If they complete them, their success rate, in the words of not recidivating, not recommitting crimes, is really strong. Mm. So the, we just had the largest graduation in the history of these programs, which exist all over Massachusetts. I'm proud to say that but just a few short weeks ago, we had 20 graduates mm -hmm. of our program. Some have said that being in this program, committing a crime and being in the criminal justice system was the best thing they're to them because they would never have dealt with this issue and gotten their hands around it. And I'm proud to say that we did it here. Um, I was obviously there to give the graduates a, a certificate of completion and let them know that we're investing in them. Um, but at the same time, as, you know, mayor, the mayor was there, mm -hmm. who's a good friend, and mm -hmm. he came at that event and he spoke eloquently about uh, their, his pride he had with this community center too. Chief Marnio came and he actually talked about how this was, he's worked the beat. He's, he's, sure, he's yes. worked this community for many, many years. Yes. He's, he's, I, I think he's doing a really fine job mm -hmm. as chief and he's been a great partner for us. He talked about how this center is. He goes, I knew this neighborhood before this, uh, this center opened. It is, and there's a word, hope, on the wall. Mm -hmm. And he said, this center does offer people hope to turn their lives around. So it was a wonderful program. I believe the large, uh, the large amount of graduates is a testament to the people, Mark Leary, and all the team we have down there that work so hard uh, for those programs and really make a difference. Because if it's just nonsense and it's phony, nobody, it won't work. No one will come. Are they there all day? Are the patrons or whatever? We clients or whatever refer to them. Are they there all day, almost like a job, 8 to yeah. 4.30 when they come? I would they say all day, but they come in every day, depending on what their probationary sentence is. Mm -hmm. But essentially, they'll come in to be drug tested, and they're given programming that they have to comply with. 
and like I said, it could be substance abuse, and at certain times, some of the folks are employed, and we work with them around their schedule so they can keep their jobs okay. but still comply with this. So it's a very great program. I think Fitchburg's blessed to have it in their community because, as I said, when we opened another such uh, facility down in Webster recently, um, I said every community should have a center like this. These, these problems exist everywhere. Sure. Uh, everywhere. It's but we're, Fitchburg is blessed to have it right in your Claycorn neighborhood, and as most anybody that's looked at this closely will say, it is an asset to the community. It has made Fitchburg safer, and anyone would welcome a, a center like that. Well, and when you just used a buzzword, that links us right into another subject, which is when you said problems such as drug addiction happens everywhere. I want to mm -hmm. talk about another program that you've been very involved in. We have talked about it briefly yeah. uh, one other time, but now it's been in place longer, and that's your face-to-face -face program yeah. where you're actually working with younger people right. throughout Fitchburg. And please explain this to our viewers sure. because, if anything, this is just such an instrumental program in helping young people. Yeah, well, Mary, I appreciate that because, you know, when, as I said, when I became sheriff and I, I talked to inmates, and 90 percent of them are addicts, and I ask them, like, how'd you end up in jail? Mm. And I heard the same story over and over. And it was essentially, I was in middle of high school, I started doing drugs, I got addicted, I stole from my family, then I, they kicked me out, I stole from uh, the people that would then put me up, and then they kicked me out, and I ended up committing crimes in the community and got arrested and went to prison. So I thought, well, I need to get ahead of this curve. I mean, as sheriff, I know a responsibility is to handle the current inmate, but also try to prevent people from coming sure. to prison. So I've tuned into this opiate issue years ago. I know it's the way the tidal wave was coming. I saw it from my day one almost six years ago now. So I brought this program that we developed. It's unique. No other sheriff in the country does it. It's based around the idea that your choices matter in middle and high school. And I bring the stories of inmates. I bring the stories of Lindsay Lohan and Charlie Sheen yes. and Eminem. And I make it very interactive with the students. But at the end, we show, we show pictures, as you've seen. Before and afters. Frightening pictures. Frightening I have to pictures. Tell our yeah. Viewers, frightening These pictures. are pictures of people who are maybe today they look this way, mm -hmm. and two years of being an addict are completely different people, and the, the young people will gasp when they mm -hmm. see them. And we're blessed to have the technology. We can take pictures then of students in the school or administrators and then show their appearance if they were to become addicted, just to re emphasize the sure. point. All I can say is the response has been outstanding. We have passed, uh, my personally, have put this program in front of over 220,000. Almost of our a, students. Almost a quarter, almost a quarter of a million, million, million students. students. Thank you. That's a good way to put it. And um, with that in mind, we focus all the time on the communities. Fitchburg's been very receptive to this. The superintendent has been a great friend. He actually not only had us come to, uh, to here to do it, but he had me go speak to the superintendent's association in Marlboro about a month um. ago. And all of the state people are asking me to come and present that program. So the, we've been great uh, here. We just were in Fitchburg High a couple weeks ago. We're going to St. Bernard's, I think, mm -hmm. uh, in two weeks. So we are heavily invested in the Fitchburg community with that face-to-face -face program. And I hope some of your viewers maybe, if you have a, a student uh, in the age group of pretty much middle and high school in the last five years, hopefully they have seen this program seen because that's my goal. And now, it, we're you, close. In the, when I went online to look at this, it, it said primarily you do it to high school for high school students. Middle school do you and high do school. Middle school, middle also. school, I would say the primary age is probably the seventh, eighth, ninth grades are probably our target audience. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy to do it all the way through twelfth grade and I can do it below seventh, but our target audience is probably the seventh, eighth, ninth, and maybe tenth. So probably equal amount of high schools and Why middle schools. Why do kids get into drugs? I mean, you know, I'm I'm of the age where I remember yeah. old Joe Friday and uh, Dragnet. Right. And even back then Dragnet series was constantly yeah. about the problems of drugs. Yeah. It's it's never gone away. Nancy Reagan and her just say no. Mm -hmm. This has no impact on our youth. Right. Why? Why why is it? It just keeps growing. Well that's a that's a big question, yeah. Mary, but I, I can only say I think there is a human curiosity mm -hmm. which does lead young people in this idea of being, you know invincible. invincible so they're not afraid of things they should sure. be afraid of. Another thing is the young brain develops in a different way than the adult brain. You, you, as somebody once so eloquently said to me, the young people develop the gas pedal before the break. Uh -huh. <laughs> so they're kind of a little crazy. Now you put that on top of certain drugs. Now the problem is that, and it's said to me all the time, you know, is that what I try to do with face to face is let people know your choices matter. For example, there's also some ignorance that goes with young people, and I don't mean ignorance in the sense of you know that. I right. just mean that they are unaware. Prescription medications, sometimes they think they're just medicine. Right. They're not even they're not dangerous or me. drug. Right. A doctor would prescribe exactly. it. Exactly. And that's one of the key things we point out in that presentation about facts and myths. The whole thing is built upon myths, 
and facts. And I talk about myth. Start off with marijuana being safe because mm -hmm. it's natural and from the earth. Well, cocaine and heroin are natural and from the earth too. Sure. This is nonsense that something's grown, it's safe. Let's dispel that myth. We talk about opioids and the fact that they're prescribed by doctors. So you're asking me why, probably for every single person that takes drugs, they probably reason. have a different reason to do it, but we know they do collectively. So what we need to do is at least dispel the myths and get to the facts. So people, at least when they put something in their mouth, they at least have some idea, they know there's a risk and they can be think twice is what I just leave them with every day. So mm -hmm. it's the it's the $64,000 question. And, and then one of the things that's so frightening is that this it continues to grow. The most recent, of course, the, the I don't know if it's a date drug, but it's certainly the drug of choice when people go to concerts, young people go to concerts, it's Molly. Sure, sure. And now the vaping. You got um, it. And, and so the problem seems to just keep being reintroduced, reintroduced in almost new formats. Every generation. That become more and more attractive to you. Mary, every generation has had its drug of choice and some have been you know uh, lethal some have not but we are now in the midst of clearly an opioid epidemic yeah. and it's leading people to heroin and we're seeing deaths at a rate that no one's ever seen I'll What's give you it, like four a day in Massachusetts. four a day in Massachusetts I can say that if you want to put it in this terms I mean you probably remember I remember the Vietnam War uh, I remember this country you know it was a movement um, more people, almost as many people died last year from opioid addictions than died in the entire Vietnam War. Oh, wow. And that war took years. This is one year. We lost almost 50,000 Americans last year. So this is a big problem. And, and it's and much like Vietnam. It's a very prime age bracket of people who should be very successful, money earners, contributing yeah. to society. Yep. You got it. And it's happening to everyone. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this on that topic. Um, I'll say to anyone in our listening audience today, without hesitation, if your family has not been touched by the opioid epidemic today, count your blessings, yes. because in five years from now, there won't be a family in America that can say that if the trend doesn't stop. So, you know, God bless the governor, the legislature, yes. Senator Flanagan, as well as, you know, the representatives. Uh, they did a great job up here to get this great bill passed. Mm -hmm. So we are moving forward. We're at least addressing the issue. We're limiting the amount of prescriptions and initial uh, uh, filling, for example. We're keeping an eye. We're creating databases so doctors can prevent doctor shopping. So the issue is being dealt with, but it's killing our young people. And sure. it's time for us as Americans not party, Americans to say, we're gonna stop this and we're gonna get to the root of this. And a lot of it is money, let's be honest. There's been a lot of money made off opi opioids. Oh yes. We need to realize that this is crazy and that we need to tackle this head on. Let's talk about something more pleasant. Sure. And you know what people love? Our viewers, everybody loves dogs. Oh, so do I. <laughs> and you have a special program. Oh yeah. And it's called the Second Chance Program. Mm -hmm. Now people who watch this show regularly have seen Nikita, yeah. the drug sniffing sure. detection dog. National TV star. National TV star Nikita. Yeah. Um, you have another program with dogs. Yeah. You've increased your dogs at mm. the Worcester House, yeah. but you've already enveloped another program with dogs, and I'd like you right. to talk about oh, it. Oh, sure. Well, you know, being a dog lover myself, but the, but the reason you do this as sheriff is there's a lot of evidence that shows that uh, dogs can have an impact uh, in the criminal justice world, that they can actually improve people's behavior, that they can be therapeutic. So I was searching for the partner to bring in dogs to our correctional facility from the time I got there. But, but I went to Needs, for example, who's just down yes. the road. They needed a two-year commitment for an inmate to be matched with a dog, to train them to do certain things, to work with disabled to veterans like and things. like the guide dog or right. whatever. We didn't have that that sort of stabilized it population. So we finally found a partner. We had an inmate work crew, by the way, out at the Second Chance Animal Shelter in the, Bur in the uh, Brookfields. And they were just con conversing about the dogs there. And we realized that there was a natural partnership. They have dogs, they're full, but they said, we have dogs that we need to have slight behavioral modifications. They will nip, they will jump up. They've been abused and they're afraid of people. Nobody's adopting them because they have these slight behavioral issues, yeah. but they need someone to work with them hands-on for about eight weeks. Guess what? <laughs> We've got a building of inmates who are the best behaved inmates. They are in the least secure area of the jail because of that, and they earn the right to be in this. There's only about 50 inmates in this area, but in that area, we try to reward those inmates with things like we gave them this chance to join this dog program. So today we have three dogs. They match up with an inmate. That inmate is trained for free. So this is all free, by sure. the way. The dog is a do brought over for free. Second Chance trains our inmates to work with these dogs. They provide all the food, and there's no cost to us whatsoever. But in those eight weeks, 
there's an entire change in the entire block because these dogs are able, because it's a minimum security area, to walk around and interact with the other inmates. The officers tell me we've never had a more well-behaved, less stressful block than once the dogs arrive. So the officers are safer, the inmates get along better, and the inmates change as people. They get a feeling of a connection to an animal, and you can see them change. And when they get out, I believe that's going to help them stay on a better path, nonviolent path, and get on to rehabilitating themselves. And the connections they make with these animals is wonderful. So I love the program, and the, the bottom line, and obviously the punchline of the whole story is, Every single dog we've had has now been adopted. We've been through almost 20. Oh the my first Lord, 12 were adopted by our own em employees. Because <laughs> our employees walk by, they see them in the yard working with them, yeah. and they'll say, what's his name, where is he? And the next thing you know, they're like, I'd like to look into it. Oh, and we have wonderful. every dog, we had one of our officers, I just went in last week, he's already knows he's adopting one of the dogs in the block, and he loves them so much. And yet, you know, the inmates are benefiting from this program. The dogs are benefiting, the community's benefiting, and it doesn't cost anything. It's a wonderful program. That, that's excellent. Believe it or not, we're almost to our finish, but I want you to talk about two things very quickly. You always have a sheriff's summer picnic. Oh, yeah. Will that happen again this year in Shrewsbury? Absolutely. Every year, I think we're, we're working on the final date now, but we think it's going to be August 20th, and um, it's always a Saturday. It's always a very special day. It's welcome to the community. It's a senior picnic. We put it on free of charge. We are blessed to have so many people that donate uh, the food and the raffle items and everything, but it's a fun day. If you've been, come again. If you haven't, think about coming down to SAC Park in Shrewsbury. We'll get the word out in the community, but it's going to be August 20th, I believe. Check your local papers to confirm the date, but it's coming. Excellent. Excellent. And, and by the way, I just want to mention, it went from when I took over, Sheriff, we only had like three, 400 people coming. Last year, we had over 1,200 no, seniors. We've no. had to add tent after oh. tent. It gets bigger every year, but it's unbelievably exciting, fun day. So I just want to point out, we have really taken it to a new level. Well, this November, I want to tell our viewers, you're up for re-election. Mm -hmm. Sheriff's a six-year term. You're up yeah. for re-election this year. Um, you know, I will say this to the viewers openly. The position of sheriff is one of those you go to the polls and you're looking at who you need to vote for and you see, Sheriff, what do they do? I don't even know what they do. You either circle in any name or leave it blank. You, on the other hand, have every day of your last six years gave us a reason to understand what the duties of a sheriff does, what are the new duties of a sheriff, and to vote for you. So I would just like to, to say again for our viewers, Sheriff Lou, Remember that name when you go to the polls, because you have made a difference. I wanted to actually get on what's new for, for your next term. Well, I'll but just say, yeah, I know you would short time. I, I just I'm getting to say, Jake telling me. I got I just want to say, I have loved every minute of being sheriff. My greatest compliment is people say to me, you know, I'm so glad I voted for you, or even if I didn't, I wish I did, because you've actually done what you said you yes. were going to do. And there's no greater compliment you can have in political life. I'm blessed to have this job, and uh, thank you for those kind words. Well, you're, you're more than welcome. And to our viewers, we thank you for watching your right to know and sitting in with us tonight. Uh, with the FRCC on FATV. Remember that your city or town local Republican committee is your only grassroots organization that supports and holds dear your liberty, your constitutional rights, and your conservative values. We encourage you to join us. Why? Because to us, GOP stands for growth, opportunity, and prosperity for all people, and because we always stand for freedom. Thank you and good night. America, we stand for freedom. So let us all unite to yearn and strive for our republic that reflects our values, that preserves our rights, and goes forth in power and might, that reflects our values and preserves our rights and goes forth in power and